Here we are, your drunken uncle, again at the BFW, and we're interviewing people in support of the Celtic Rising charitable event in support of the BFW on June 5th, and we have John Epler here with us. Uh, John, hey John, tell us what you're, you got, you got a dangerous weapon in your hand, tell us what this is all about. <laughs> this is a uh, training longsword for armored combat. What we're going to be doing at the Celtic Rising Festival is a medieval deed of arms. We are going to have two groups of armored combatants from as far as Kansas City, parts of Texas, around Oklahoma, maybe further out. We'll be hold, one group will be holding the field accepting challenges from the other group in much the manner you would see in the 14th or 15th century in what would be called a passage of arms tournament. We're going to have people traveling great distance to do this in support of uh, VFW Post 577. It's our goal to have actually as many people on the field that day that are also veterans. Excellent. So back in Excellent. the day, these groups would have gotten together and had this tournament, and it sounds kind of like a free-for-all. Are there rules? Lots of rules, lots of uh, social um, customs that would be observed. This was something that evolved during a period of time where there would be truces in a war, sometimes lasting years at a time, but the armies would still be close to each other and a lot of them just felt like there was, they still had a need to do some fighting so they would <laughs> hold a field. Um, one thing that you would see happen, a passage of arms like we're going to be doing is going to be a very formal affair. This is in support of a larger event, but it could be as simple as a group of knights deciding to block a bridge and challenge anybody that wanted to cross it to fight. <laughs> and they're, uh, nice. So we're we're doing the we're doing the friendlier version of this. We're going to set a time in a field, and people can come and that do this and can show up, put on their armor, and uh, get some fighting in. What will happen is both groups will actually at the end vote who on the other side d demonstrated the most prowess on the field, the most chivalry, the most honor, uh, and they will vote that person to be the first among equals from the other side. So you're basically not only having to fight well, but you're also having to show some manners, some decency, yeah. some, uh, some honor and character, yeah. and you're being evaluated on everything on this. Now other things that can be done, even if he's a good in reverse side on that, is that even though I wouldn't want to normally strike at armor to expect it to do anything, if he doesn't move, if I strike, I drag down his armor, drive the point into the weak spot in the mail. So he's going to have to do something. So if he moves to cover against this, I'm going to look at him, trying to gain control of him and be able to put him to the ground that way. So we're going to be fighting in armor from head to toe, plate covering the head, the torso, the arms, with some simple gaps in the armor that are going to be more um, accessible because they have either mail over them or maybe a little bit of cloth when we're trying to find the gaps in the arm. Now, also over here we have a class going on, beginning footwork on Bolognese side sword. Classes are built with structure to teach fundamentals that everything builds on itself towards the opponent being able to free fence with a multitude of weapons. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, and these gentlemen will be here for Celtic Rising. Now, what's the most what's the most important um, uh, aspect of character, you know, for uh, for one of these uh, participants? Um, I would say honesty and generosity. You'll often see um, people will give gifts to the people they fought. Some just small token of uh, their respect and uh, camaraderie with that person. That's and awesome. yeah. so I'm, I'm sort of curious like how you would show generosity in a battle. I mean, isn't it sort of, you know, every man for himself and to the death? Um, often, in, well, in armored 
an armored fighter is very hard to kill. And often a armored fighter is worth more than as a hostage than he is dead. During this period of time on a, on a, in a war, uh, there were cases where like high ranking officers or knights that were known to be worth a lot of money to their commander would be captured on the field. They'd be fed, clothed, allowed to participate in tournaments like uh, at one point uh, a number of knights and the king of, Eng of France had been captured at uh, the Battle of Portier in 1356 and they were brought to England and the king of France actually worked out in ransom to go back to France. He, however, his people were having trouble paying the bill. He, uh, his son had exchanged places with him. He eventually went back to England to send his son home while they figured out how to pay the rest of his ransom. He crossed that border a couple times willingly wow. and came back. He eventually got sick and died in England. Uh, at the end of the Battle of Agincourt, uh, Jean Lemange, uh, Marshal Boussico, the commander of the French forces, was taken and uh, eventually entered Henry's service and died in, in England uh, in captivity. But uh, once Henry's son was to become the King of France. So the, the people, one thing is on this, we didn't have nations the way we think of them today. Mm -hmm. right. They had a, um, they had families and most of all these people were related to each other at some remove so it wasn't um, this was a time frame where the royal family of England spoke French in a in formal settings more than they used English right so what's your favorite movie that has a, the best sort of replication of uh, fight the kind of fighting style from the medieval period that you, you it know, we haven't Henry, actually got Henry a Fifth. good a good movie that covers it exceptionally well um, because in movies you see people hitting each other with the edge of the sword in armor and they didn't really fight like that they would usually shorten the weapon to use it more like a spear or for leverage to like hook into their armor and throw the guy rather than just try to beat on him beating on him dulled swords dented armor right. and didn't do a whole lot waste of energy so you would see a lot more emphasis put on finding a weak spot in the armor driving the point into it throwing the opponent uh, using a spear or pole axe on the battlefield this on the battlefield a shorter sword long sword like this would be carried basically as a backup weapon like it with a dagger I if I was going into a larger conflict I would be taking some weapon that was more effective at range and had a little bit more mass. This was like an axe or a yeah, spear. pole axe or a spear. Yeah, wow. and we'll have fighting at uh, the long sword and armor, the spear and the pole axe. There will be some fights of just straight uh, dagger fighting in armor. And that's all taking across the street. It'll right? be taking place across the street Saturday at ten in the morning. Saturday ten. Oh, so right. even before the the actual Celtic Rising begins, so you got to. We're come going out to early. be out. We're going to start our part of this early because. It's going to be very hot out and right. <laughs> wearing a lot of plate. It's just, it's better to start the day where Absolutely. it's a little bit cooler. Right. So we noticed some lads uh, practicing downstairs. What's, can you tell us about what's going on? And right now we've got um, a class on dagger fighting going on uh, using a medieval rondel dagger. It's basically a, uh, a spike type dagger that was predominantly used for anti-armored fighting, but it could also be used just as a, a normal street weapon. They're working on grappling techniques, dagger fighting, a little bit of longsword fencing, and we're about to start a more Renaissance-oriented class on uh, a weapon similar to the rapier. That's going to be starting about 7:30. So we have classes two nights a week and armored combat training out of my house on Keystone Lake uh, a few times a month. So we cover a lot of a lot of different fighting styles from the Middle Ages to the early modern era. So based on historical sources. If uh, uh, viewers want to find out more about your organization, how do uh, they do that? Look up tattershall.org, T-A-T-T-E-R-S-H-A-L-L.org, or come by VFW Post 577 Monday or Thursday nights from 6 to 9. Sounds great. And what's the name of your group? Tattershall School of Defense. Great. Okay. We're a 501c3 educational nonprofit. 
we're uh, the Tulsa branch. There's other groups in Southern California, DC, Washington State, Arizona. So those who are interested can come, come down to the VFW and, and just, just check, check it out. out. And yeah. just check it out. And you know, come out to Celtic Rising June 5th, make it early, 10 a.m. so you can catch the tournament. All right. John, all John, thank you so much. Very welcome. Uh, yeah. you being on your Great. Hey. You're drunken uncle, you're drunken uncle.